love to welcome Wafa Ghanim to um, our conversation today. Um, Afa, Wafa is an American-born Palestinian businesswoman, writer, and artist. She founded Tatriz and Tea in 2015 to preserve Palestinian Tatriz embroidery and storytelling traditions in the diaspora. Her published book titled Tatriz and Tea, Embroidery and Storytelling in the Palestinian Diaspora documents the traditional patterns passed to her by her mother, award-winning Palestinian embroidery artist Faria Al-Abbas Ghanem. Tatriz and Tea has since become a social media sensation and a global initiative offering online and live classes around the world in service of promoting the practice of Palestinian embroidery by anyone, anywhere, anytime. In 2018, Wafat was awarded the prestigious New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Traditional Arts for her work in preserving and teaching Palestinian embroidery around the globe. From teaching at universities around the world to becoming the first ever Palestinian embroidery instructor at the Smithsonian Museum, Wafat has led it to Tatriz Revolution, a global collective of embroiderers, allies, designers, and artists who are committed to preserving Tatriz in the Palestinian diaspora. Tatriz and T now offers all classes and lectures completely online. Mufa is a collection specialist at the Museum for Palestinian People, an instructor at the Smithsonian Museum, a researcher at the Met Museum of Art, working and is currently working on her second book. Um, she currently resides in Washington, D.C. It's uh, lovely to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so I wanted to dive in a little bit about the before, um, before establishing Tatriz and T. Um, what were you doing before this project started? Um, were you kind of like doing a completely different career? What was that process like for you? Yeah, um, well, I have my master's in international management, international business. So um, where I actually studied Mandarin Chinese and I like traveled China and Japan and did like field research there. Um, and so previous to Tatariz and Tea and the work that I'm doing now, I was in the private sector, which is really funny because um, so my master's thesis originally in my MBA was about how we can implement um, kind of the virtues and sort of methods of the business world in a nonprofit um, context, because I felt that nonprofits could really benefit from the efficiencies and kind of some of some of the concepts that um, sort of follow uh, the success of businesses. And um, so I did like my master's thesis was in, in, in studying Mercy Corps and sort of and I would focus on Mercy Corps because my MBA was in Oregon um, where Mercy Corps was headquartered. Um, so that was just kind of the what I've always been interested in. And when I was in the private sector, I kind of found myself honestly very... Um, exhausted. I, you know, I, I did the work I'm competent and I'm reliable and dependable. And, you know, I was always very efficient and finished my work, um, early. And, um, and so I got, I was very, very bored sort of towards the end of my career in the private sector. And that's when, um, everything sort of came up in terms of writing my book. Um, it was while I was in the private sector. Um, that's so exciting. And that's definitely something that I've kind of thought about as well. There's just like some like translation issues happening between nonprofit and for-profit world and like the different frameworks. And they're kind of like constituted to be like totally different institutions, but they actually share a lot of like structural similarities that people don't really key into as much. Yeah. And I feel like the business world really benefits, like they are trying to be more profitable. And there's all these practices in terms of sustainability. But when it comes to the nonprofit world, we're talking about donations and how to make donations stretch. So it's really important for us to be efficient and sustainable. Sustainable, we think of right environmental sustainability, but there's also economic sustainability and social sustainability in terms of our impact. Um, so, I, you know, that's why I sort of, when I developed a disease and tea, and then this last year became a, um, an LLC, I decided to make it a business. Nonprofit, first of all, is very hard to achieve. Like it's very time consuming to do on your own. It's a lot of paperwork legally. Um, but that's why I felt like, like I could make it work. I could still be mission driven and have 
um, this as an LLC or a business kind of practice. Um, and I felt that that was a, like kind of an important um, value that I had in terms of communicating how ethical a business can be and should be. Totally. Um, I actually did notice that on the website now things are, you know, marked as Little Cities Institute LLC. Um, I wanted to ask, like, what's the process been like to convert it into a business? Has it been like pretty straightforward for you? Um, do you feel like it gives you a lot more flexibility with regards to what um, you want to accomplish? Like what has been like maybe even the most liberating aspect of like moving it to an LLC over a non-for-profit? Well, I was never like an independent nonprofit. I was um, in the early years of Total Studies and Tea, I um, maintained what's called a fiscal sponsorship with Brooklyn Arts Council when I was living in Brooklyn, New York. And Brooklyn Arts Council is who was like my, they were my main funder, but being that they were my fiscal sponsor, basically donations could be made to the Brooklyn Arts Council um, and still be tax deductible for the person who donated. The only thing with that is um, Brooklyn Arts Council took fees out and then there were like payment fees on their platforms. And then I only received I, I didn't have any visibility of what was coming in. So it was really hard to know what was how how to best steward the donations, you know, like what was the intention? So by the donor, like what were they trying to support? And and so just that um, inability to kind of under have a connection with the with the donors and all of those fees make it, made it really hard for me. Um, I mean, but it was great. I mean, they were really helpful for the you know first few years, and then I went into like sort of self employment where I was just taking on kind of contracts, and it was just like you know, independent contract work basically. And then last year I decided to be an LLC um, because I, there's protections obviously made to LLCs like legally and, and tax wise, but I didn't find it to be hard at all. Um, so far so good, knock on wood. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. It, I just, I like the visibility of things. Like I like when people um, want to support my work. Yeah, it might not be tax deductible, but when they're submitting like a donation on the website, they're telling me exactly what they want to use it for. Do they want me to acquire historic dresses for study? Do they want me to develop my Syrian embroidery research? Do they want me to develop my next publication? Like there was communication there. I can send them thank yous and presents, you know, things like that. And I, I just like like that relationship, you know? No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I really do appreciate it. Cause I think like ethically driv driven businesses are really achievable. It's just, we haven't really given the space to really think about it and execute it given like the people kind of create like this black and white, you're either like a toxic corporation or you're, you know, a non-for-profit and that has its own kind of shortcomings as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I am trying to make a living. Like I do need to make a living. Like this isn't volunteer. It, you know, I, I would like to have this as my career. And so, um, I just, I want to be like really transparent about that. And so maybe, you know, yeah, this isn't, I could be making much more income by working in the corporate world and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I would like to turn some sort of a profit, AKA an income so that I can sustain the work that I'm doing. Like, you know, the time it takes to research and put together a course is astronomical. It's, it's like, not just the foundational knowledge I have from the years of research I've been doing and sort of the lifetime mentorship I've had under my mother, but it's also all this additional research I've, I do for that particular course. And I believe I should be compensated for that. Um, you know, like for instance, on my website, I sell patterns and I've received some sort of like criticism of that on social media. Like, well, why are you trying to profit from Palestinian embroidery patterns? And it's like, the demand that I received was that people wanted Palestinian embroidery patterns 
the symbolism, the history, and the strategy on how to stitch those patterns. So for me to do that research, to put it together and format it into a document and to devise a strategy for stitching, and then also to present the pattern stitched. So I have to stitch it or I have to find it stitched somewhere so someone can, whoever receives that pattern can see where it belongs on a dress. Um, that's a lot of work. So I'm not just presenting a digitized pattern. I'm actually trying to um, like educate the person about the pattern, its origins, and as much that I could put together as possible. So I feel like, yeah, I deserve compensation for that time and that knowledge and that intellect. Yeah. Right. And um, it's, it's interesting because um, a lot of this comes down to like how labor is valued and what kind of labor we we choose to like consider permissible and like which kind of labor we consider should be free um, and why that is and how that's kind of like built into like some of the, you know, the, the ideologies that drive some nonprofit work. Totally. And I think specific to Palestinian embroidery, historically, it's been um, well-to-do Palestinian women who can afford to self-fund a personal collection of dresses and publish and present those dresses. And that limits the conversation, that, that limits the field to a select few. And as I, you know, I value, you know, if it wasn't for those that have preceded me and my elders, I would not have like the platform I have I have today and 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 the knowledge and and mentorship that I have today um but I I firmly believe that I need to be able and anyone who gets into this field in the future future generations who are this is their inheritance they should preserve their cultural heritage as a Palestinian that they also should be able to make a living from it and not depend on the you know their so socioeconomic status um, in order to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm going to move us to the next question. Yeah. So we have time to go through all the sides, but, um, what was the moment the project actually started? Uh, so, you know, after I wrote the book and released it, I, I think the, like, the way the the it's hard it's hard to really pinpoint an exact moment, but I think after the book was released, after Tutsis and Tea was released, um, that's when I realized that it made an impact. I had self publish I've self published it. I didn't publish it through um, an institution or anything like that, and. Um, in part because I I never felt I, I never felt like I was a part of those institutions and I always felt really excluded. And then the other part of it was that I just I didn't want anyone to have a say over what I included. This is something I was documenting. It was an oral history documentation of the stories passed on by my mother. And I did not want anyone to have a say except for me and my mom and my sisters, obviously. Um but uh, then when I put it out, so I thought I was just doing this thing for my mom and, you know, like that was kind of the bounds of it. And once it sort of went out into the world, I started to get invitations to teach and talk about the book and teach patterns from the book. And that was very unexpected. I did not expect to receive that in type of inquiry. And that's really when I realized that this was not just a book, that this was, um, and not just a project, that this was like an initiative. And at that time around 2017, when the digital book came out, I started traveling like everywhere, almost like two to three times a month with a full-time job at some point I, I was pregnant and at some point I had a newborn and I was still traveling. Um, and so it became this side hustle. And then suddenly I realized about a year later that I didn't even have time to work anymore, um, which is kind of the tipping point for somebody who has been pursuing something as 
a on the side from their job that they realize that they don't even have time to work that 40 hour a week job. And then you realize, oh, I made it this into my job and this is what I'm going to pursue. Definitely. And I think the other interesting thing is um, sometimes we do these things to like archive and, you know, explore our own personal histories, but they end up being like really communally beneficial and like they really serve as this like very um, embodied and very like resonant way of like bringing community together. Oh, totally. I was really touched that other people, you know, other Palestinians in the diaspora felt connected to this book. On the one hand, I saw that other Palestinians in the diaspora also had learned embroidery from their mother or their grandmother. Um, When I, all the Palestinian embroidery books up until my book, told me that this was an endangered or a dying art, but then here I was practicing it. So I said, well, I wanted a book that showed that it was alive in the diaspora, that it wasn't dead. And then on the other hand, I connected with Palestinians all around the world who were touched by my book because they learned embroidery through the book and my mother in a way sort of by proxy kind of passed it on to them through the book. So it was really like a very touching realization, I think for me. And then was it always named Totris and T or was that something that kind of like came through a few iterations? I spent, I I still have the little book. I have like a little kind of moleskin notebook um, covered in names. And I was going to do something like, anyways, I came up with all kinds of names, which ended up being headings in the book. Like in my book, Tatsuris and Tea, there are all kinds like, like the Chronicles of the Thobe and Tatsuris Revolution. And those were all originally book titles. Um, But once I found Tatsuris and Tea, like once that rung a bell. And it was when I was, you know, living in Brooklyn. And honestly, it was one day I was walking. I don't even remember where it was, but it was somewhere in Brooklyn. And it just was like, ding. And I wrote it down and I started asking like my friends and they were like, definitely Tatsuris and tea. Like I gave them sort of my short list. So once I landed on that name for the book that it's always been that but I decided to do the Tzatziris Institute um, for my business last year because I had dreamed from like when I first started Tzatziris and Tea that I would develop like an institute um, and I wanted it to be in DC and I wanted to teach uh, embroidery and textile traditions, not just of Palestine, but of other areas as my research grew. So the idea of an institute helped me feel like this inclusion towards institutions. And I felt that this was worthy of that, this work that I'm doing. Who are the five unlisted co-founders who you've never met that inform your work? Um, I think over the past few years and the way that my research has developed, um, the main sort of researchers that I've just basically memorized you know, all of their research. Uh, So Sheila Ware, who wrote um, Palestinian Costume, published in 1989 and a series of other books. Um, I think I've memorized almost everything she's written um, about Palestinian embroidery. And then, um, so Sheila Ware, Grace Crowfoot, who is an archeologist and um, she was very popular in the early 20th century. Um, she made the connection between King Tut's tomb and the embroideries that were that were found in his tomb to greater Syria and the working of the embroidery in part being from um, the Palestine Syria area, which is a huge, um, hugely important part of like my reference point in terms of history and traceable origins. The third, I would say, is Dr. Jillian Vokalsang Eastwood. She published, um, she's published many amazing books, but um, the Encyclopedia of Embroidery in the Arab World is uh, a really key 
a sort of piece of academic documentation that is an incredible service to not just Palestinian embroidery, but Syrian textile, Syrian embroidery, um, Lebanese embroidery, Jordanian embroidery, just the entire region. Um, and then I would say, uh, oh, that I've never met. Oh, well, I haven't met Hanan Munayyir. Hanan Munayyir um, wrote a book called, um, I think it's Traditional Palestinian Costume Origins and Evolution. She published it, I think it's 2016 or 2019. Um, and that has really, she has like this opening introduction about traceable origins of Palestinian costume. And that has been a jumping off point to a lot of my research because she, what I love about Hanan Munayyir's writing is that she is not a trained art historian. I think she's a microbiologist or she's a scientist. And so a lot of what she's presenting in her, in that short chapter is questions. She's just asking a lot of questions and uh, it leaves it very open to um, our work. And then I guess I would say the, the, fifth person. Gosh, this is a really hard question. I, I would say um, I'm going to leave the fifth spot for like my great grandmother who continued this and passed this on to my grandmother, Hamha, and to my mother. And I never got to meet her, but she also taught my mother um, embroidery uh, when my mom was little. And yeah, and and just uh, some of the stories I've heard from from my mother is that she was very informative to my mom's training, which subsequently informed my training. Uh, what are some of the things that created friction that slowed you down before you launched? I guess what I can say is this: I started writing Tatties and Tea when I was like thirteen. I still have like the the notebook with the markers and me writing the table, and I still have it here. And like me writing things and stuff from learning from my mom. And I have so many iterations of Tutsuris and Tea before it became Tutsuris and Tea. And the reason that I don't know, I, I guess I'm looking back like at all those years of me trying to write this book, but never writing it. I, I, I don't know that I was ready. I don't know that I had enough life experience, like, you know, and before I started writing this, um, I started writing it in, I think, 2015. And I had spent a number of years like prior. So before 2012, I had been traveling to visit my family overseas like every single year. And it, when the, the conflict started in Syria, um, it cut me off. Like I, I, I wasn't able to go visit my family in Syria, because that's where my family was exiled to. Um, I wasn't able to travel over there. And it was that in sort of double exile, I think, that I don't know, like it created this like longing to kind of not just write about what I had experienced before, but to reclaim all the things that I learned and to sort of this project became really like identity affirming for me um, in terms of like who I am and who I've come to and where I came from. And so I think the, that this when the Syrian conflict happened and it sort of cut me off from my family in Syria and all the worry and sort of secondary trauma that comes from that, um, I think that journey helped me kind of reach a place where I could reflect on who I was culturally and, and maybe why. We're going to like pivot pretty hard um, to kind of like talking a little bit about the project as it kind of like evolved. Um, and I think we kind of touched on this. So if, if this feels repetitive, we can do a different question. But um, if you ex had to explain the project in phases, how would you describe each phase? I guess after I wrote the book, I think the first phase of like this sort of educational initiative where I was teaching Palestinian embroidery, um, 
it started with this phase of workshops and doing like workshops in universities and doing, um, I, I, I think a lot of people who saw me lecturing between 2017 and, and 2000, maybe 19, they saw a lot more of my personal story about the story of my mother, about how this art form was passed to me about, um, you know, diaspora and how we've kept these traditions alive. And it was a very personal kind of time where I was sharing, um, you know, my family's way of passing this on in the diaspora, because my real purpose in the start was to hopefully inspire other Palestinians to pass on um, this art form in the diaspora as well, and to kind of give them some ideas on how to do that. Like, how did my mom do it? How am I doing it? You can do the same thing. When the pandemic hit in 2020, um, before the lockdown, like the first lockdown, um, I went into virtual teaching, like before anybody else was teaching anything virtually. I started doing Instagram lives where I was helping people get supplies and prepare for lockdown. I was offering like free classes. It was, I think, March of that, right before we hit the lockdown. And that's when I hit that kind of virtual level of just beginner classes. Like, let me teach beginner classes, get people the basics. And I think around, because of virtual learning, like just have it, people like rapidly want, they want more and more and more and more. And I couldn't keep up with the teach, the, the, the demand of how much people wanted to learn. Really shortly after that, the next phase was um, larger projects and like doing things like on garments, teaching people how to do other types of stitches, like couching stitch. So I was like the first Palestinian instructor to offer couching stitch, satin stitch, anything like that in person and virtually. Um, of course, since then, now you see people kind of doing their own local sort of thing. Um, and then once that phase passed, I got really into the Hiska art history and sort of studying um, not just the different styles in Palestine, but um, the techniques, the cuts of the dresses, the um, how the social, political, and economic history of that village or town impacted the style that had developed before 1948. And so I started looking at everything within this art historical context. And now I'm in this phase of um, like I'm moving now in, I'm in museum work and I'm in lecturing within an art historical context. So now I've like kind of taken it into an academic sort of phase where, um, I want to bring like not just Palestinian embroidery, but textile tradition. So that includes the various fabrics that were woven, um, the dressmaking traditions, things like that. I'm, I'm bringing that into a museum context because I believe that this is a fine art. And it goes back to what you were saying initially that, um, you know, this work is largely like undervalued and it's, it's because it's women's work. It's been considered women's work, but I believe that this is fine art and I believe it should be elevated to, to a museum. And so that's where my, my next sort of phase of mission is to elevate this art form into, you know, into these museums and present them within an art historical context. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, could you talk us through one example of like how a village's social economic status impacts the cut of a dress? Yeah, maybe not exactly that, but in looking at an art historical context and considering all the factors, um, for instance, um, you know, when you're in, I'll go with like my mom's hometown, Safad, and like the Galilee region. Safad used to be under the Ottoman Empire, under the Damascus government system. 
And so you find that if you were to look at the Suffolk styles or the Upper Galilee styles before 1948 within Palestine, it looks like the most unique eclectic style. And actually a lot of Palestinians say, oh, well, they didn't do embroidery in the Galilee. They did, um, but they didn't do cross stitch. And because of that, they've been left out of Palestinian embroidery books and they look like a very different style. But if you look at the Upper Galilee as a continuation of even Southern Lebanon and um, Southern Syria, you see that those styles had a lot more continuity and similarity um, than the rest of Palestine. And so, so sort of like understanding that developing geography, understanding how colonialism and those borders divided cultural communities that belonged together. And, and that period of exile after World War I or, or disconnect that occurred to those families on those borders, um, like that helps us understand where that style came from in the Upper Galilee. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Um, I um, wanted to ask, like, what were the most instructive turning points of the project? I think in when you say you are ethical or that you want to have ethical practices and you're in the work that I'm doing, which is related to cultural heritage, there's a really important part of this work where you are responding to feedback from the community and you are accountable because I am solo. Like I work for myself, you know, but it, you know, technically legally in tax world, I'm working for myself, but actually I'm working for our community. And so to, for me to be able to say that I'm, you know, to, to kind of feel like, okay, who are my stakeholders? Like, I guess if we were to use like business terms, who are my stakeholders? Who is like my board, you know, of advisors? It's really the Palestinian community. And um, it's really the points in feedback from the Palestinian community. And I'm not just talking about the like expert, you know, the my elders who are in this field. I'm talking about you know, the next generation of Palestinians, my generation of Palestinians and their feedback that's really been um, the most instructive. Of course, there's um, a lot of negativity on social media and you can't um, like absorb that. And I think, you know, that's been the most maybe disappointing part of this work is experiencing the negativity from other Palestinians in the community. And that's like desire for divisiveness in the community that I really, I haven't been able to reconcile or understand and still continue to be disappointed about where, you know, there's this idea of who you are and, um, and once you get like kind of written off or somebody doesn't like something that you said or, or did at one point in your life that suddenly, you know, you're to them, you're, you're, you're not useful. They don't want you anymore. And that cancellation, I don't understand that, um, very well. And I, and I think that needs to change because, uh, we need more solidarity in the community, but, um, but I think like some major turning points has been like, there have been a couple of times when I first started doing research um, and I started surfacing all these images from the Library of Congress and their archive. They have like this mass archive of like images of Palestine. And I posted them on my social media with the captions that were written by the Library of Congress. So to me, I was like, oh, I'm citing the source. I'm using the proper caption. Turns out Library of Congress is, their captions are all wrong and they're all very Orientalist. And there's a whole historical context for why that happened. Um, the benefit though, is that they've digitized all the images so we can sort of reclaim them and recaption them. But the responses I received from um, the community of, you know, when I posted those images really helped instruct me on like the directions to go with my research and how to, um, be of service in this community in terms of like, how do we accurately identify these images so that they're useful to Palestinians and we don't have to 
depend on the Orientalist captions of the Library of Congress, for instance. Um, so those kinds of like moments where I've I've been held accountable to the content I've created or that I've presented have been extremely beneficial and um, like I welcome I welcome them and I, you know they've helped me grow. Yeah, that's um that's an interesting point about like where there's like a conflation in social media between like accountability and just like attacking. And it can get like really hurtful because, you know, for people at the end of the day and, you know, um, it's just really polarizing and really heated. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if I can just add, like, you know, I, the whole point of my work was to develop culture bearers in the Palestinian community who can then carry on and keep teaching Palestinian embroidery. I want um, others to do that. So this, there's a fabricated drama of like other Palestinian embroidery teachers that have come in the last year or two um, where they're teaching in the community, but I support them. Um, and uh, there's no, there's no, I don't have any like negative. That was the whole point of the work was so that it wasn't just me. Do you know how tired I am of teaching a beginner class? Like, I'm glad we have people teaching beginner classes and leading stitching circles in their communities. Like, this is how we keep this alive. That's That was the whole point. When I got on social media, no one was doing this. So I'm so happy that people have been inspired, maybe from my work, maybe not. Um, maybe they didn't like my work and they wanted to do their own thing. That's fine too. But we're all here working towards the same mission. And, and I think we should really sort of um, move away from these fabricated kind of divisive um, narratives in our community and kind of just try to support all, all of us who are working towards cultural heritage preservation. Um, on, on that note, um... I know that you've grown your team. What what's the process been like of like making a first hire, adding like new teachers, or how has that experience been like? Well, it's very again very organic. I have we have now. I've been teaching for so many years, and I have taught. I have taught thousands of students. I mean, I, anywhere I go in a Palestinian community, any place I've ever traveled, like. They're like, oh, I took a class with you like four years ago, or I took a class with you here or there. And that. like, I'll always remember my students, a huge student community. And um, certain people within that student community have risen to be leaders in their own way. And I am only, I they don't work for me. Um, we collaborate and I support them. I share, I share the platform with them um, so that they can uh, build their own practice and, and teach in their own way. Um, so I have now, um, so I'm working with now four uh, teaching assistants. Three of them are Palestinian and one is Egyptian American. And um, she has like a fashion design uh, background and she's a seamstress and like she knows historic sewing practices. So that's why I've been working with her. And Egypt is close to Gaza. So some of their cuts are similar to South Gaza cuts. And then I, ha I work with two people on our admin team who um, are not Palestinian and they build that allyship spaces. Um, so while my like main priority is teaching Palestinians, I also um, teach non-Palestinians, some Arabs, you know, from the Arab world, but also some like white people and people who um, are, are trying to build their own like allyship in the community. And so what Shanti and Alina do in the community is they have a sort of a, a allyship meetings where they can say, okay, how do we go beyond, um, you know, the, the needle and thread to express solidarity for Palestinians? Like, what does it mean to be an ally? And so I'm, I'm grateful that we're building out all of these spaces. Yeah. Um, this kind of takes me to, um, the in in your about section you have like a very clear 
belief. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read it because I think it's so robust and it's also very, um, like it, it, it's not afraid to make a statement, which I really love about it. Um, the Tzatziris Institute is founded in the belief that the study of embroidery and textiles in Palestine and greater Syria cannot be divorced from its historical context. Anyone interested in joining the Tzatziris and T community must stand unequivocally against the appropriation of arts and culture for Palestinian liberation and fight against the oppression of marginalized and oppressed communities equally. Individuals that are not able to meet this criteria must first build their activism and alliance prior to joining the Tzatziris and T community. The Tzatziris mm -hmm. Institute is not a service to the culturally curious, it is an active agent in fighting for Palestinian liberation. Therefore, the Tzatziris Institute works to build an informed ally movement that stands against oppression, appropriation, and erasure, not just for Palestinians, but for all indigenous, BIPOC, and LGBTQ communities facing the same. So how did you um, build this? Was this something that you worked with a community to workshop? Was it something that like you... Um, like wrote one draft of and you know or was it kind of I, it, it feels informed by your research so how did this kind of like um come to be developing my curriculum in a museum context has exposed me to um a influx of white people who are just culturally curious. They can't even say the word Palestine and they still want to join my classes. They view uh, discussion of how a village was ethnically cleansed, which to me um, is the part of the foundational knowledge of understanding the art historical context of a dress or a style. They view those kinds of discussions around ethnic cleansing of a village as um, um, tra traumatic and overwhelming and they have to just step away from the computer and um, they can't listen to that part of the lecture or like um, so I'm not interested in making this palatable for white people I'm interested in educating um you know, non-Palestinians about the, 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 these are stories, these ethnic cleansing, you know, the ethnic cleansing or the depopulation of a village is a story like that villagers who survived that told their children. They did not have to be older or more informed to hear a more gruesome version of that story. Children, Palestinian children are hearing their elders with the real details of these stories. If you are not strong enough to understand, like if you are not intrinsically strong enough to handle that conversation, you have more allyship work to do before you come to me. And furthermore, you know, these, so I'm not going to go off any more on that, but just to answer your question on how this was formulated is in developing the, these curriculums for museum contexts, I've learned that there is a, a, a huge uh, community of people who attend museum classes that are just there to learn the stitch. So if you were just to come to learn cross stitch from me, I'm not teaching you anything new. It's a cross stitch. What do you, what I, there's nothing magical. The 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 reason Palestinian embroidery is Palestinians is from the motifs, the meaning of the motifs. And in order to understand the motif and the style in which that motif came from, you have to understand how that style emerged. And therefore, there we are once again back in the history, trying to understand how the style emerged in that particular part of Palestine. So. Um, there was sort of that frustration of like, I don't want to bring people into the Tzatzis and T community who are fragile and like use their tears and their fragility to avoid these hard conversations. These are safe spaces, first and foremost, for Palestinians to talk about these histories. OK, and for us to acknowledge that that history happened. OK, Um the other parts of that statement involve um, my belief that that you that that like fighting for the liberation of Palestine is not um, separate from fighting for the liberation of um, Black people, of Indigenous and Native people. And and of people in LGBTQ spaces and communities. I know that I'm not being totally inclusive of all gender identities when I just summarize those acronyms, but um, 
that all of these uh, all of these sort of identities and 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 movements are all a part where no it's that saying you know where it's like no one's free if someone isn't free no one's free no one can ever be free and i believe what we all have to work in lockstep my son is black he's half black half palestinian part of my job you know his father teaches him about being a black man in america my job as his palestinian mother besides teaching him Palestinian customs and cultures is to embody allyship and to embody allyship to the black community. So I too benefit from allyship work and anti-racism education. So if I myself am doing anti-racism education and engaging with people in spaces I've cultivated that are not informed in anti-racism and believe their work is done, then I don't wanna teach those people. Um, and that's just a boundary I, I wanted to develop. Yes, I suppose I didn't workshop those statements. I just made them. Um, that is the first draft of that statement. Like I wasn't, it was just that that was what it was. And it came from a real frustration of kind of the fragility in what I was experiencing in museum spaces and sort of just being done with that and wanting to have the right to protect these spaces from the, and, and asking those people to leave if they weren't ready to learn from me. Certainly it's limited um, who's registered and enrolled in these classes, but um, it's uh, fine by me. I want more, I want people for more further along in their anti-racism education to, to join these classes. Yeah. And then um, before moving to the quick Q&A and then the Q&A um, that we open up to audience members, um, I wanted to ask, like, can you talk a little bit more about like the motifs and how they developed? And like, I know your mom has the Cleopatra motifs. Oh. So you can just talk about that. Uh, I think it'd be really interesting to hear more about. Yeah, I mean, the symbolism of Palestinian embroidery motifs, um, also in Syrian embroidery motifs and things like that. Um, is really vast. So I'm sure we can't cover all of it. Um, there's, a, you know, some motifs that have ancient origins. There's different categories of motifs. Actually, I'm writing about it right now for something that's being published online um, soon. So I'll send it out when it's available. But there's different categories. And um, one of those categories, besides like ancient and, you know, um, you know, political and, and these kinds of things, um, is one that is uh, regarding kind of like um, sort of sentimental stories or stories within a family that has been passed down where a motif was actually used to tell a story throughout time. You're referencing the Cleopatra motif. So when I was growing up, my mother... Um, explained one particular motif that's in my book um, that's called that she called Cleopatra. And of course, Cleopatra has ancient history. And so we talk about that and the sort of like the strength of Cleopatra and her story being embodied in these motifs. There's like a mask, like a bejeweled mask in the motif. There's a high heel, Ali. there's a crown, um, two crowns actually to demonstrate like her power, her strength and power. And um, we also have a ring, which looks like a flower, but on the inside, there's like some swirls. And that's the ring that carried the poison that she drank when she committed suicide before she was captured by the armies and that whole story. So um, Cleopatra has passed on to me that motif through my mother with this context and those meanings, but I never saw it anywhere else. That's why I included it in my book. Um, and I don't know. I don't know. I haven't met other Palestinians who were like, yes, my mother called that the Cleopatra um, motif as well. But there are these different sort of categories of motifs and um, they all have different origin stories, I would say. Yeah. Did that answer the question? <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, okay. So moving to the Q&A, um, what are you reading or watching right now? Oh, so I have been watching The Crown and um, on Netflix because I have never viewed colonialism from the perspective of the colonizer. And it's been really interesting <laughs> to, to watch. Um, yeah. Reading wise, uh, I'm not, I don't particularly read anything. I, um, I go through like chapters of things in my research, but I'm focusing a lot on Syrian textiles and, te and weaving practices in Syria. Yeah. Um, who would you love to shout out for a day, past or present? 
I think I would have loved to shadow. I know with that Kawar, Miss Wadad, she is um, still running the Tara Center in Jordan. I would have loved to shadow her in the 50s or 60s when she was acquiring her collection and talking to all the embroiderers who made the people who made their own dresses, like what those interviews and talks looked like. That would be really cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? People always think that I'm just teaching kind of like the basics of embroidery or different regional distinctions of Palestinian embroidery, but I teach a lot more. I teach a lot more about the traceable origins, ancient history, symbolisms. I incorporate my research for my next book at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So objects we have at the Met. Um, yeah, so I, I'm... I'm really pushing a lot of theory, like a lot of different types of theories in my work that haven't been documented before. And a lot of people ask me, well, where can I learn about those? Well, you can take classes with me. That's where I talk about, that's like my space to talk about those things and a more, it's like a higher level of discussion with students and, and others. So yeah, um, if people want to intellectualize a little bit with me, I have a lot of ways to, <laughs> to do that. But that's, I'd say, the biggest misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. um, whose work do you admire and are inspired by? Oh, definitely Sheila Ware. Sheila Ware, who wrote that book, Palestinian Costume. She is. The, she did um, what I'm doing with the Met. She did with the British Museum. Um, so she went through the British Museum collection, which was Museum of Mankind in the 80s. And she identified all the all the dresses in Palestine and talked about them in detail and all of this and then wrote a book about it. And that's what I'm doing with the Met. Cool. Um, okay, I will open it up to audience Q&A. Uh, Noor, would you like to ask your question or would you like me to ask it? So lovely to hear more about your work in this context. If you were to design a new motif based on the current phase of your work, what would it be? Oh my gosh, that's such a great yeah. question. <laughs> I'd like to, I, I feel like, you know, something regarding Palestinians in the diaspora. And I, yeah, I guess I, I, I wish we could develop, and maybe this is a challenge for audience members uh, and embroiderers in the community. Um, I wish we had a category of motifs that were, um, reflective of our diaspora experience. I talk about this in my book, actually, back in the day. Um, I thought like, well, wouldn't it be because when Palestinian women in the past used to embroider things that they saw in their surroundings. And like, I wish we had more of that reflected for the diaspora, you know, where one day I could be like, oh, that's a Palestinian diaspora symbol from Germany. That's a Palestinian diaspora motif from America, from Canada. And like, I could like actually differentiate those. That would be cool. That would be really cool. Awesome. Okay. Uh, next steps, uh, please be sure to follow Wafa on her social media, uh, which is here, Tatariz and T on Instagram. Um, follow us on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And if you could submit the feedback uh, form, that would be really appreciated. Um, Wafa is coming up with a second book. I don't know if you want to give like a quick spiel about it or if you want to, we can wrap up as well because I know we're a little over. Um, but yeah, we're excited to see more of your work and we're excited about the second book and to keep in touch yeah thank you yeah i'm still working on it and researching it i'm it's based and founded in the collection at the met who's given me permission to publish patterns and digitize patterns from their collection and and keep their collection accessible to the palestinian community um you know, I am self-funded, so, uh, you know, people supporting my work in any capacity um, by going to my website is uh, all helpful towards my next publication, which is a very expensive endeavor, but a worthy one, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.